All right, what is up, everybody? Uh, I am back with Matty from Voltaic, the number one aimer in North America, the winner of the Ready, wait, the Red Bull. Red, hang on, Matty, what? I'm blanking totally. It's it uh, the Red Bull Ready Check Championship. Ready Check, there we go. I knew it was Ready something. Someone was ready. Uh, but yeah, the essentially, you know, you are, I think, one of the biggest pillars in the aiming community. You're someone that I know has continually pushed sort of the, the or you're trying to push the edges. It feels like you have multiple PhDs in aiming at this point. So I'm super excited to talk to you because the last conversation we had was was amazing and people really loved it. And there's lots of cool stuff that you've been up to. Um, you know, I made a video recently on, on you know, you releasing the report that you did on your training with Elige, uh, the programming and sort of just your, your, your thinking throughout all of that, which I, I mean, that's amazing that you did mm. that. So we'll definitely talk about that and, and much more. Um, so just firstly, you know, is there anything that you've been doing that, you know, you've been or that you've been working on that's new in your life that's that's uh, that's cool that you want to talk about? Well, as I just uh, discussed before we started this, um, I've actually gotten into the master's program at my college for software development, and that's been taking up most of my time. And I'm trying to be a good computer scientist over here. So that's pretty exciting. That's setting up the rest of my life. Um, and besides that, I've just been focusing on coaching through Amphiltaic and, you know, pushing scores uh, here in Aim Labs, Kovacs, pretty much everywhere. I've been trying to just continuously improve myself over time since we last talked. Nice. And and I, you know, firstly, you know, congratulations on, on the Masters and having like a, you know, a plan to mm -hmm. have outside of esports if necessary, uh, which is always good, you know. <laughs> Esports can be volatile, so always good to have a have something else to to kind of go into if that does not work out. Um, but one thing I really like about your general uh, philosophy, I think, in terms of how you approach aiming and how you've you know how you've kind of pushed the envelope with it, is how you research and study others who are really strong aimers. And one of the you know absolute favorite things for me that you have done is the secrets of or unraveling the secrets of aim. And for those of you that are not familiar with Matty's content, it's a video series where he sort of takes sort of, let's say, the best aimer or, or rather aimers who are known to be extremely good at one particular sort of you know, bit of aiming theory. They have maybe their own style. They have, you know, maybe it's, it's a person that's, you know, extremely good at smoothness or a person that's amazing at, at flicking, like just various focuses. And uh, with that, I um, mean, you know, my favorite is actually the snowy. Uh, video, which is all about smooth aiming, which is actually something that people really obsess with in uh, in tactical shooters. Uh, YouTube is constantly telling me that if I want to make a video that has a lot gets a lot of impressions, I you know people keep searching like smooth aim. So um, go check out Matty's video with Snowy. I think it's fantastic. Um, but with with that, with all of this research, um, you know, Matty, how did this series kind of come about for you? And you know, what have you sort of learned as you've kind of made these videos? Is are there a lot left to to be made? I think there are a lot of videos for the secrets of aim to be made. Uh, I think the main thing that inspired this whole series was just, I, I said this in a tweet before, it was mostly of the fact that I recognize myself as a combination or some kind of amalgamation of all of these different players and techniques. Like when I watch really good players from before my time, like even Cartoon, Bardoz, all of these good names in the aim community that are known, I tend to like assimilate their uh, techniques and try to imitate them and do my own combinations and bleed overs with them. So the goal with the Aim Secret series was originally to honor those people that we get these techniques from, that all of the greatest aimers today use. You know, we stand on the shoulders of giants. So I wanted to make sure that we paid attention to them and realize that the techniques that they basically invented and defined aren't going to be forgotten, right? Because it, it's sort of like an honor or an homage to, to them. That's originally the purpose. I love that. I, 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 particularly, I particularly love that because um, something I, I talk to people about with the Amy community that, that struck me is I, d I didn't really know about the Amy community until... Um, I suppose really a couple of years ago. I'd, I'd been working at AimLab for a while before I really understood the depth of it. Um, and I was, felt like I was operating very much on the outside. And then once we started doing the aiming tournaments and so on, I started to get, you know, to know a lot of the personalities. And I started to really realize how many people in the aiming community that there are that take it really seriously. And 
how you have so many players that have achieved so much in the aiming community. And so I, I love the fact that you're kind of honoring the history because it is also quite a new thing ultimately. Like I, I think it's the aiming community, correct me if I'm wrong, but my sense is that it really, really started to grow maybe even during like 2020 during the pandemic. Is that is that correct when it really I took think, off? I think it's only been like three years that it rapidly started to grow. And the history of aim training and all of these players that I'm trying to highlight, it goes so deep past like 2021, 2020. Like even Kovacs FPS aim trainer was really what we consider the first aim trainer and that came out in 2018. So there's a lot of players that I still haven't covered and even maybe don't even know about uh, whose techniques we kind of take from from them and we use them today awesome yeah that's that's cool it's super cool um and that's really you know it's, it's, that's why it's also great to talk to you about this stuff because there is so much value here that people might not know, necessarily know about um speaking of which uh, with the unraveling the secrets of aim videos um it, what is there any any ones in particular that, pe that people that really stand out for, for the community that people have like loved a lot more than the others i'm, I'm curious well We've already mentioned the the snowy video. It actually is the most viewed video on my channel now, so ah. it's really taken off. And I think, I think the reason why is because Snowy is just he has been like a really really underrated player. Uh, the first time that I really learned of how good Snowy was was when he like performed in the Kovacs leagues and uh, actually came really close to beating me back then. And his aim is just something else entirely like it is so clean so smooth and it's even the title of the video it's like the majestically smooth aim of snowy and i think a lot of people begin to realize like oh wait a minute like aiming isn't all just about like flicking and being snappy it's like you are cons you are way more consistent and aim and way more perceptive of what you're seeing on screen when you're aiming like snowy so i think that one is probably the biggest one so far and uh, I, i'm i actually put out uh, another video about tracking and that hasn't really taken off as much so I, i'm pretty sure snowy is the big highlight of the se of the series so far that's the skooky one the tracking one the skooky one is actually coming along but it, it hasn't reached like the kind of viewership that the mm. snowy video has surprisingly well yeah. the skooky video is mostly all about like very direct smoothness and it's more of the aiming category of it rather than let's like its application in game, which is why I think more people look to the snowy video. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I, again, I think also given how you know much we've seen Valorant be a success and how many players play that game, and also I think I think you know AimLab did a really good job in in terms of their their branding, their marketing with with uh, with Valorant, and I think also because Valorant doesn't have the tools in the game like Counter Strike does. It, I feel like you've got this swell of tactical FPS players who are obsessed with, you know, flick like flicking and smoothness. Uh, as, as, so that might be part part of it. Um, I think also, you know, you made some amazing insights in that video that um, stand out to me. I think you just met. I think you just referred to one whereby, if you aren't just really really speedy with your flicks between targets, if you instead have a, a kind of slower uh, travel between you know target to target, you're actually able to process the peripheral um, more quickly. Right. So, which which is was was a really interesting um insight I, and i that totally kind of you know caught me off guard when you mentioned that so yeah lots of gems in that video so if you haven't seen it please check it out i'll, I'll have uh, the link for maddie's channel in the uh, in the uh in the description below so uh there we go so um we can move on to talking about aim coaching because of course that's something that you've done a lot of and uh, i'm sure that you know there's a lot that you've learned over time as you've as you've coached players in terms of you know um, what makes a good aim coach essentially. I'm sure you've, you must have uh, feel I, I mean, you must have changed your practices over time. So you must have uh, you know be making mistakes early on and then sort of corrected those. So I'm really curious to see what you feel like right now makes a good aiming coach and what maybe some of the um, let's say misconceptions might be. I think that the main thing that Amped will take really pushes uh, on all of us as coaches is to be collaborative and. To not be like, how do I word this? To not really be a teacher, but to actually embody like the coach idea rather than the expert or someone who's just imparting knowledge or lecturing people. It's more so because AIM is so mechanical and so like deep and detailed and also subjective in many ways, you have to, as a coach, be just as deep when we, when we, 
dig into clients and when we try to question them, figure out their strengths and weaknesses, like the mark of a good aim coach is one who's actually going to actively work with the client and work through their weaknesses and isolate what they need to work on like together rather than as, oh, I'm a teacher and I'm just giving you like a routine and I'm just giving you like, oh, here, here are your issues that you need to work on and I'm going to be separate from the process. Like that is completely not what we want to be doing. The coach and the client are working together at the same level. And I think I'm kind of, I'm honestly kind of the person who likes to teach a lot. And, you know, I like, I make videos and, you know, I've done like various kinds of teaching for just in general aim training and gaming in general. But I think from the first few sessions of coaching that I did, like I had to make that transition into being an expert to being a coach. And I think that was the most important thing and the good mark of a coach. <clears throat> yeah, that's that's a that's definitely an interesting way to put it, actually, because I I felt this way about uh, casting or commentary, actually, where you know you as a player you can have a lot of knowledge, a lot of knowledge, you, you know, you, into it, your intuition is really good in terms of understanding what's good and what's not, and you may even be able to kind of name some of the concepts, but it's a completely different beast entirely to actually communicate that to somebody you know who doesn't understand those things and to help them to then be able to understand how to. Uh, comprehend and then integrate those things where where they're at, so they get more value. That that in of itself is a huge skill. Um, so, um, when with regards to like uh, isolating, you know, strengths and and weaknesses, um, is like when I was working with Mini um, briefly to kind of trial the Amped program. You know, he was he he really focused on this a lot. And he said, look, this is your strength, and this this looks you know this might look completely different to somebody else, but this is clearly your strength. Um, is that something that when you're coaching someone, it's quite quick for you to be able to see how, you know, where their kind of natural strengths are? Is it easy for me to like pick it out and, or, yeah. or is it more of a, a mix thing? I think with the more mechanically focused, better players who already know a lot about AIM, like uh, we've mentioned Elige, I'm actually still working with him uh, in the AMP program. He's renewed the the original program. And I think <clears throat> with the better players, it's a lot harder to specifically say, uh, like, oh, you, this is your like main strength, because since they're better players, you could kind of pick out like many strengths. And you have to like, you can't really just choose one. And you got to work with all of them. And you got to try and to like reinforce everything. Is that, uh, is that yeah. what you were looking for? Yeah, no, it, yeah. So it it makes sense to me in a way because um, I feel like it's easy to to look at aiming and and for so many players, like okay, I'm not as good of an aimer as you know Donk or someone like that. So even my strengths might not feel like a strength if I'm if I'm comparing them to kind of where I'm trying to get to. And I think I think what I'm trying to get at uh, here as well is that um, the 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 strengths. Let, let's say you know if if you're a player that's that likes to like move quickly and likes likes to be quite snappy with your you know flicks and so on that might actually also carry across a gameplay style as well the kind of pl situations you want to place yourself within and these types of things and so when mini was talking to me about sort of my strengths i was like oh this this these strengths are reflected also in how i see the game and as so the aim is kind of an extension or rather the game is an extension of my aiming style like you're more of an aggressive player or like whatever or if you're a player let's say that's that's um you know higher sense and you've got you know really good you know micro corrections and smoothness but you're not really snappy really speedy it might be the case that maybe you're someone that actually kind of processes the game a little bit slower but that's not necessarily in of itself a weakness you just have a different approach and I think, I think to me, that was what was particularly interesting because I think when you, it's so easy when you're looking to improve your aim to just look at like these really good players and to kind of almost disregard like who you're, like what your identity is as, as an aimer, as a player. And so I think that's what I'm really getting at because I felt like you guys did that really well. And that in of itself was kind of empowering as I was able to say, ah, I can, I can look at this and be proud of this and know this is kind of part of my identity as a player is like these types of skills. So if that if that kind of clarifies a little bit more what I'm getting at, that's exactly what we try to do in Amped, and I think that's like a separation again of what makes a good coach versus what makes like an average coach. Like an average coach would probably look at these players and they won't see that full identity and how they play the game, and they'll just 
strictly take a look at uh, what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, and they'll give them a routine. But the problem with that routine is that, you know, if it's completely just copy paste, you could be trying to mold this player or this client into something that they aren't or something that they that doesn't complement their strengths or their identity or their play style in game at all. So what we do in Amped, and this is why I emphasize like working on the same level as the client and trying to understand the the game through their eyes is when we do that, we're actually helping to build a better routine that complements their strengths and it takes their natural style and it just boosts it uh, and keeps all of the things that make those players unique. And I think that that is the main way that we should be continuing to do coaching because, you know, players like Elige and all the players that we're coaching at Amped, they have unique styles and it works for them. And there's a reason why, like, they're pros and their play styles are successful and we just want to make those stronger we don't want to we don't want to mold our players into something different or some objective standard because really there isn't any yeah that that's another thing that i feel like almost felt to some extent maybe some kind of a misconception or a myth in in one way where it feels like you know there is kind of a, a top tier of aiming and and that's kind of what you should kind of look to get to but again, upon you know seeing all of the insane just players from the aim community, I'm like, oh my god, there's every random grip, every sensitivity, every mouse and, and pad combination, and all of these players are able to find their way to aim that it would absolutely like the mechanics would absolutely allow you to play at the the pro level, the absolute you know be the cream of the crop. So that blew my mind. I'm like, oh, this is kind of relieving to understand this because it allows me to kind of feel like oh i'm like i can be sort of my own aimer and find my own way i don't have to go on to like pro settings and like copy you know all of the best players who are aiming like really well that week and like oh this guy's got a new mouse and everyone's using the gpx and your brain gets flooded with all these different things that aren't important and so that's why for me it's like oh this is kind of relaxing actually because i don't i can just focus on what is important because now i know what it is i think that when copying people uh, at the pro level and copying settings it's it's not as important that you just see like, oh, a pro is doing that, therefore it must work. Like that, is, that idea is completely thrown out nowadays. Uh, I think if you were looking up to a pro player and you're inspired by a pro player, it's more about like, first you should be asking, okay, I want to use their settings, but why are they using the settings that they're doing? What kind of style or aiming style does it complement? And I think more importantly, it's just, Besides settings at all, you should really just be looking at aiming technique and all of the things that go into aiming technique in general. Yeah, that makes makes sense. I know we'll talk more about that in a in a little bit. Um, I, I need to know, you know, what makes a bad aiming coach? What should people sort of avoid if they're looking for, you know, help in this regard? So this has been a topic of discussion like constantly in the past couple of months. I think that what we call like fraud aiming coaches is, is mostly given by the fact, and a, a friend of mine actually said this, uh, VT Viscos, she says that basically you can identify a fraud coach if they just repeat what other people say. And the routines that they make or the resources they use are just repeating generally good things that other players in the aim community tend to promote. And they don't really have the capacity to analyze themselves and as well teach other teach their clients to to analyze themselves and i think i think the main mark that i'd like to say for like fraud aim coaches or bad aim coaches is really just if you are an aim coach and you claim to have the answers to or the solutions to improving your aim and you claim to know all about the techniques that players need to to learn for for games like Valorant and CS, and you're going to aim coach them, you should, why don't you have good scores in the aim trainer? Because the aim trainer is really the place where your skill that you're teaching is absolutely isolated. So when I see aim coaches like everywhere just saying that, oh, I have the solutions, I have, or my routines are the best, or you guys gatekeep everything, but all my stuff is free, but where are your scores? Uh, on well-known scenarios that absolutely have been 
beneficial for many players. Where are the high scores and where are the world records there? Is kind of my question to them. It does. It does to me feel like uh, a different beast compared with uh, because if, if there's a coach that's you know coaching you know Valorant or TCS you know Quake or whatever it is, uh, you know I'm definitely not thinking about their in-game skill meaning a huge amount to be able to be a good coach um, because there's so much so much of the theory and, and the strategy, all these different things. It, you know, it, it doesn't really. Um, that guy doesn't need to spend loads of hours and in fact it can actually be quite detrimental if that person wants to be a very good coach to be spending as much time like getting to the, the you know like a radiant level like top level uh, yeah, of, of play I, actually i think with val with actual in-game stuff uh, or game sense strategies there's a meta to be played and these coaches they don't have to be like top top level in their games like i know there's overwatch coaches who you know they might be down to like master's level and it doesn't really matter when you get the time to analyze those tactics and i think that's more important for an in-game coach but the difference between aim coach is that it's just so mechanical and everything is so like based on preference and subjective that really i think your main metric is the aim trainer and i just think that with an aim coach it's a little bit different from you know a game sense coach or a, a pro team coach for an actual game yeah that, it definitely makes sense and it's also um <laughs> more encouraging and inspiring like again like i remember when imini was coaching me and you know, maybe there'd be like a moment where he'd be like okay you know watch watch my screen for a second i'll show you you know i'll show you what i mean with something and then you know he'll start just you know just destroying the task and i'll just you know i'm getting like a free show and i'm actually you know inspired and and also in awe of um of, of what he's able to accomplish and also like as you say I, there is a sense for me um Again, as a commentator, I know that, you know, there are lots of commentators that can do a great job without being a really good player, but it is a massive bonus if you are, because there are like small, all of the micro of the, of the in-game stuff. It, you can't really get a strong sense for that unless you play a lot. Like you have to be in those scenarios yeah. because it's, it's so much driven by int intuition and it's so fast that the only way to really explain that or understand it is to is honestly to actually experience it. Otherwise, you'll never see it when you're watching. And so for me, that's a big bonus, but it's not necessary um, for, for great commentary at the same time. So yeah, it, interesting distinction. Um, with with regards to aim, aim coaching, you know, of course, because, you know, you're coaching people, a lot of different people, and you've worked with a lot of pros now. Um, has, there, has there been anything from you coaching others that has actually helped you to improve your mechanical skill? I think mostly from, especially amp coaching, I learn a lot about what things specifically transfer into games. So if I really wanted to pivot and actually go for certain in-game titles or be pro in something else other than aim training, I could actually, I'm actually a lot better off finding like the routines than I would have been without coaching. Uh, I'm able to pick out the scenarios and be a lot, pay a lot more attention to the micro, as you said, for things in game. So like, because of Elise and because of uh, Goose Breeder coaching and uh, Apex coaching that I've been doing, I, I understand these games just a whole lot more. And I think it just makes me a better coach and also a better aim trainer because I'm able to recommend scenarios. And I'm able to describe scenarios that i want to be created for things that i see in those games that i otherwise would not have ever really experienced at that level yeah i mean that that makes a lot of sense and that would be that'd be cool to see so i i, I hope uh hope i get to see that sometime um if, if you ever decide to kind of you know switch to coaching in that fashion that'd be really fun to see um but i'm, I'm curious as well uh with regards to uh, coaching something that I've come across in trying to um, you know help various people and and understanding where my issues were with aim training, I feel like it's it's pretty easy to understand that you might have a difficulty with a certain skill in a game. Like oh, I need to work on my flicking or something, and people are saying aim lab is a good place to go, and I can go and you know do these playlists and so on. And so there's there's resources and, and videos that people can watch um, where the, you know it could be you know your videos, my videos, like whatever. But the one thing I feel like it's very hard and might be a, somewhat of a barrier to access for the person who can't afford an aim coach or doesn't want to go down that route is understanding once I have all this set up, I've got a playlist, I've got a routine, I know what I'm supposed to work on, I've got these benchmarks, all of these things. When they're actually in the task, 
I feel like there's something that is very dangerous that can happen um, and if it's not taken care of. And that is that if you're not intentional on your focus on how you're actually executing in the task, like if you don't understand what improvements you have to kind of actively make, you'll sort of end up probably most of the time be reinforcing poor habits. Um, and if you're, and this is, I think, where the highest value is to having a coach because they'll be able to say, oh, this is the problem and this is what you have. You have to focus on this particular thing. It could, maybe it's like, you know, the, the, the arm tension um, for smoothness. Maybe it's actually, hey, you know, you need to, maybe if you like raise your sense, you know, this will help, you know, you kind of to retrain your, your, your ability for smoothness with this tracking task. Like it can be so many different things, but I feel like that's the barrier to access that I see where players might, if they don't have a name coach, might get stuck. What, what's your kind of thoughts on this or how to even approach this if, if someone is, is getting into aim training? What should they be focusing on? How should they know what to focus on to make sure that they're, they actually improve when they play these tasks? I mean, the main thing that I've been recently seeing is just a lack of self-autonomy. Like, I think a lot of the times with aiming, people will get stuck immediately and or they'll have like a million questions that they start to ask around and they, they start to really depend on someone else or a better player telling them the answer. And I just think that for people who are experiencing this barrier that you're talking about, it needs to be, they need to find the answers on their own. And how do, how, how do we find the right sensitivity to use for a scenario? How do we find like the right way to go about uh, managing tension or learning about that. And I think the main answer to that is when you're playing the routine that you say when that you see and you have everything set up the way you like it, you should be paying really, really close attention to just how it feels. I don't want players to be really looking at stats. I don't want players to be looking at the, to be constantly worrying about their accuracy or their their settings that they're using. I want them to just constantly be asking themselves as they play, is this challenging me? Is this too easy for me? Uh, and and why is it challenging? Like, is, is it because when I watch it back, I look like I'm stuttering or I'm not smooth? Does it look like when I watch it back that I just fall off the target at some point? And, and why is that happening? And it's like, instead of relying on a coach to, instead of bringing those, coach, uh, those issues to a coach and relying on them to tell you the answers, you have to engage in this, very analytical process where you just are constantly asking yourself these questions every single time you play the, the routine or every single time you play the run of the scenario, uh, paying attention to tension uh, in your arm. And I think, that, I think that just because of the overload of information is where a coach like would really be beneficial. But for if you're in it for the long game and like long-term aim training, you're just trying to improve without or, or on your own, like solo, self-found. It's like you have to come to these answers on your own and you have to feel it out. And you have to, um, I would say, when you're watching the, the pro aim trainers, say if you're watching me, like, and you're trying to learn how to do dynamic clicking, you're going to maybe ask like, oh, what's, what's Maddie's sense? Or what's the settings he runs? Or what's his FOV? And I'm like, those are the wrong questions that you should be asking. <laughs> you should be asking like, how much tension am I using in this part of the run? Or how does he play this so that he's so smooth? Something like that. And you should be comparing your VODs to my VODs. That's how I want people to approach uh, learning from me. And I think that, that is, that's where the barrier is. Many people just rely on those quick, easy answers to their problems as soon as they uh, run into them in the aim trainer. And I think that once you move past them, learn to move past them on your own, that's when you start seeing the big gains and that's when you start really getting into it and learning. That's a, that's a really great answer, actually, because I think people do <clears throat> generally approach aim training as you'll like kind of passively improve all I have to do is just get on, get in the task. So I love that the way that you set that up. And I have to say, actually, um, you know, th this, this is another reason why you guys should definitely watch the, you know, unraveling the secrets of aim videos because, um, Matty, you know, if, if you're not going to you know, catch his streams, cause he talks about a lot of these different, like some of these different ideas. I, I found the Skooky one, uh, very helpful as well, because you had the, the hand cams as well. And it, it started to like, a few things started to click for me when I watched that video where, uh, cause you're, 
you know, you can see, um, because you put all these different processes in the video where Skooky will be maybe playing a tracking task that's like, you know, just a super easy strafing target. And you can see that he's just isolating his wrist. And you can see, mm -hmm. you know, okay, there's there's a certain amount of like tension control, the isolation of the wrist. But then you'll see a progression of different tasks where it now you can see that because of the range of motion that is required to to move, okay, now the wrist is some, somewhat limited. So you've got that wrist skill that's being built up, but now you've got to incorporate the arm as well. So you're starting to see these more complex, um, you know, relationships between these different elements. And you can, but you can also see the isolated versions and how it all comes together. And so I was like, ah, oh, this is really interesting because Skooky has, th there's some things that are particularly difficult. I forget what that task is called. We have the tiny ball that goes in these, um, it's like really tiny and it'll go up into the, like really high up into the air. It's and vertically. Yeah, uh, that bounce. would be VT mini track. That, those tasks are like really hard because you you like lose um, position on the on the pad, and right. al although you know th th these aren't necessarily like super practical in terms of um, you know the in game application per se. It's really interesting how you just were describing how Skooky solved these problems because you run out of pad. But but Skooky solves it so that you don't actually he, he you know he's able to reset and minimize the loss of score and continually keep aiming um, effectively. So seeing all these things broken down, I think it starts to kind of, I think, help people to understand what are some of the things you, you can focus on. Like it starts to unlock this sense that, hang on, if I think about aim more, I can come to these solutions. And when I when I spoke to Mini, he said the same thing that you said. He, he said, I asked him, what's what's the most talent, or rather, what's the, um, what does the most talented aimer look like? What does that mean? And he said that, the most talented aimer is someone that understands like how to improve. Um, so his answer wasn't that, oh, you know, a talented aimer is someone's got really like amazing raw, like, you know, mouse control or reactions or anything like this. Instead, it was, no, it's about how effective are you at learning how to see your mistakes and then how to correct them. And I thought that was really interesting because you kind of just also mm -hmm. just mentioned that. So um, I hope this helps people because this is a huge problem I see. Um, are there any other things that you think are, are barriers to access or, or things that you common, commonly see people do wrong that kind of sabotages their, their aiming journey? I think that, and I've been looking into this recently with Viscos again, um, when I went over like the questions that you should be asking yourself, like, is it too, is it too easy? Uh, I don't want to say that people tend to be overconfident or overshoot themselves. Like it's good to, to play sometimes like, much harder scenarios but i think that an early at an early level a lot of beginners tend to just shoot for the hardest tasks based off of the intuition that oh if i get better at playing something super hard then um you know as a result uh, the easy things that i'm trying to improve at actively right now will be uh, a breeze later on and i think that they'll go into things like I'm sure you've saw, seen the the aim secrets video on MBM or mm. on pure reactivity. They'll go into those categories <laughs> at like a novice or an intermediate level, and they'll try to be learning that. But the problem is, you need to have an understanding of aim. You need to have a fundamental uh, understanding of aim and tension management to actually use those techniques and uh, not suffer as a result. So I've seen many many players like. They'll go into pure reactivity and they'll adopt this really snappy, rigid style of reactivity and they'll just throw all movement reading out the window and their tension will just spike here and there without uh, throughout the run. And I'm just like, that's the problem of skipping steps and uh, not working on like fundamentals of movement reading because those scenarios are so tough that they reward these kind of not so good habits for aiming if you approach them at a novice level. And I think that's another big danger. So uh, don't overshoot yourself. Don't overreach. Try to just go through things a little bit slower. Make sure you are being challenged, but don't make it to the point that it's like MBM reactive and you're just breaking your wrist. <laughs> Dude, when I watched that video, I like, I was like, this is cool and everything, but this is actually disgusting. I like, I, it just stressed me out. It like, it actually seems stressful to, to, to like try to aim like that. So, um, but good educational yeah. material though. Even I don't uh, really do it anymore. It's all, it's all aim scenarios uh, with instant XL and stuff. It's, 
I think that if you're a high level player, it's worth a try doing it because you do learn, as you could say, educational stuff. Um, but it's just, it's too intense, honestly. <laughs> it's for really uh, realistic aiming and aiming that just, you know, feels good to do. So with with uh, some of these things said, I felt like, you know, we could, you know, we talked about um, tension control a lot. And I, and I know that that's, that it seems so obvious to me now. It's, it's so important and it impacts everything. Um, and it's quite complex. And I think I can just, for those of you that don't understand the, uh, this idea, if you, if you understand how like throwing a punch works in, you know, oftentimes if you, if you do martial arts, you'll be taught that <clears throat> you want to have no tension in your arm when you're throwing the punch, but you have all of the tension, you know, right, right. When you're going to make contact, so which allows you to have more speed and control as the arm is in motion and then to have the most power once the, you know, you're actually going to make contact. So it's, it, you know, it's, it's kind of the same idea that if, if you increase tension or decrease tension throughout a movement, it can have different impacts. And depending on what you're trying to do, it can be more beneficial to do it in a certain way. Um, and so I didn't really think about this at all, but that's a big thing to be aware of. Are there, in, in the terms of, you know, flicking, tracking and so on, Matty, do you think there are, like, what, what are some other um, the concepts that people should be aware of when they're trying to, uh, you know, understand their aim if they don't have an aim coach other than something like, you know, tension control? I think we should start, probably start with flicks. Um... Because you got into like we went we got into sort of tracking earlier a bit, mm -hmm. um, and I think tension plays a big role through everything. And I think with flicking, if we let, take a look at uh, how Bardos plays static or the Bardos method, and um, you know we break it down into the initial flick and then the micro. I think that a lot of people tend to miss out on the micro correction. They they tend to. They tend to try to make direct flicks or they'll make their flicks like smoother overall. And I just think that is counterintuitive to really what a flick is. So flicks, the initial flick should be snappy. It should be rigid. And you should be able to see that in your VODs uh, in aim training. So when you're doing like static or when you're doing switching, it should be very quick and very rigid. It shouldn't be this flowy motion. Uh, even in dynamic, I'd say. But the micro should be a degree smoother than the flick uh, because you're trying to like confirm your shot on the target. So that should take a little bit, not necessarily slower, but it should be smoother and you should be able to perceive it a little bit easier. Um, I think that's would that would explain like my main thing about flicking. And would you say there's a correlation between the tension for you know with speed like so if you're going really fast high oh, yeah. tension if really slow low tension is that is that just generally how to think about it well when i think about like aiming it depends on the distance of the flick really uh, for the more narrow flicks you want to kind of detense for it a little bit just so that you're able to preserve that smoothness uh in the middle of those like clusters of targets uh when you're doing micros uh, if you ask Minigod about it, he'll actually tell you his whole idea about smoothness with micro scenarios and how important it is. Um, I think when we consider tension and flicking, we also need to talk about like where it's located. So we have the arm, we have the wrist, and then you have your fingers. So say on a static scenario and you're and you're performing like really wide flicks. Most of that tension is going to be, I think, in your arm, uh, if that makes sense. Especially if it's like you're a low sense player. So when you're flicking a really wide distance, like at maybe, I don't know, 70 cm per 360, even though that's really slow, a lot of that tension is going to be in the arm. But when you land on your target and you're trying to perform the micro, that tension, you should feel that tension move to like your wrist, just ever so slightly. And that's something that you need to be paying attention to in most of all flicking uh, static scenarios. Yeah, it makes, it I makes think, sense. I think for switching, it's pretty much the same thing, except overall, we want the tension to be lower uh, for switching. And a lot of uh, like sky switch, I'm sure Mini has had you play some of the uh, more horizontal switching scenarios. So 
usually the tension we want to be lower for there just to make it easier for us to hold endurance throughout the run awesome is there anything anything else in the territory of flicking that you think that people should be thinking about i think this is mainly something about uh static clicking something that i've been saying uh, a lot about people's runs is fluidity and all that comes down to is not being disoriented after your flick so you say you make a drastic flick say you need to like decelerate or kind of sort of wind down the charge from that flick it's sort of like your analogy of throwing a punch we need to cut that sort of like recoil time down so that you just continuously keep moving through the run and this affects like in-game pacing because if you're taking shots and you have to perform like these really wide motions and then transfer into these really narrow motions, you're going to have delay in between that where you're just going to lose a duel or you're just going to lose sense of your pacing. And I think that fluidity is the right definition for that. And I think that most people need to pay attention to that more in flicking and static clicking to not, to not delay after taking a flick and to just try to move through things, move on from their targets faster. I, and I think, uh, you know, you, you've already kind of mentioned that, you know, you stream and people can watch your stream and, and the VODs. Um, something else that um, can be helpful to to help to spot some of these things is uh, AIMLAB has a replay system and you can check people who have got really yep. good scores and you can kind of see, um, you know, what's different. And it can sometimes feel like, well, they're just clicking faster than me. Uh, but I think what I try to do normally is to try and break try to break it down as much as possible to see well if i try to increase my speed well what happens okay well if my if my if my technique is is off then i and i can't increase the speed do i need to play a task which has you know it needs to be slightly easier and i can kind of work on my my speed with precision mm -hmm. or you know just trying to start to tweak things in in that way and try to respond to it um, as opposed to just saying oh well, that guy just clicks stuff like faster than me i think it kind of goes into it goes into what you're saying before where I, it's 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 kind of a brain uh, game, ironically, where where when the aim is concerned, because you really do have to figure it out. And if if you don't, and you and you're having problems, you shouldn't sort of be. If you're getting demotivated, don't just be like, oh, I'm, it's not working. I'm demotivated. I'm gonna mm -hmm. stop doing this. Uh, take that as a point of of oh, I, hang on, this is not working. Let's try to figure out why. Um, you gotta really have that. <laughs> That's really it's a balance happen. thing with tension, especially. Uh, like everyone's amount of tension that they want to exert is going to be different. There's so many variables like mouse pad, mouse gates, uh, mouse weight, even. Um, it's going to be different for each person how much tension you need to exert for flicks, and you need to you need to find that balance on your own. And I think that um, that's really the main difficulty for things that keeps people from understanding. Like, oh, how can I develop like snappier flicks? So I think. I would say that the easier way to do it, uh, to develop like really fast flicks or to just click faster, is really to just fine tune your settings in a way that will condition you or, or force you on the scenario to perform those wide motions. So say you're lacking in speed, don't play the scenario that has uh, the tiny dots and uh, that have like pretty narrow motions. Like you wanna be playing really wide wall scenarios that will like force you to build that speed and you need to be uh slowly start with like maybe large targets just to have that speed and then if you want to work on accuracy after that decrease the size of those targets on the same kind of scenario and uh, that's basically how i got good at like wide wall flicking i think uh, one thing that i have to mention too is um because it was a personal experience of mine was i i remember hitting a barrier as a player with um with certain types of flicking and with with uh, and also certain types of tracking and it took me a while to figure out that oh this is because i'm trying to do everything with my fingertips and my wrist and i there's another component here completely which is the arm and so then this and this is really i think where where when i started working with mini this this was became the obvious thing and that he was helping me to work on which is hey your arm is underdeveloped this is a tool that you have um is this something that everybody should be thinking about or is it is it, you know, let's say you're someone like me and we're talking about the strengths and stuff. Is, you know, 
should I be trying to like, you know, like learn arm aiming or can I do everything with, you know, fingertips and, and, and wrists? I just have to maybe increase my sensitivity or something like that if I'm struggling for range. You know, how, how would you kind of look at this if you if you come across someone that you're coaching like this? I'm actually kind of the opposite of you, I think. I'm more of an arm aimer. I do a lot of things at a low sense. So, you know, it kind of compliments me to try and do everything with my arm. But the problem is the distinction between uh, playing aim trainers and playing in game. I think, I think if I had a client come in and he mostly like trained with his arm, just like me, while I, I would encourage him to go and experiment if he has never before uh, with his wrist and at a higher sense and performing micros with his fingertips. Like, I think that is important. But if, if he's tried it and and he really doesn't really find it to be comfortable, like I said, we're not going to try and mold these players into something different. So for clients like that, I would say if they've tried it and if they don't really like it, I'm not going to push them to do different things like that. Um, I would just try to maybe, if it is indeed a weak point in their aim, I would try to sprinkle in some scenarios and, give some hints that maybe they should be trying to work on it, but I don't want them to completely make use of that full different range if they're not like ready for it in the moment or if they just don't want to. We don't push clients like that. And I think the deal is different with aim training. With with aim training, uh, I really think that there's value in being an all-rounder. Uh, I'm an all-rounder. So what I've been trying to do recently is actually work on like uh, micro adjustment smoothness and at a high sense so things like really low sense uh, i mean really high sense 20 25 cm i've been trying to push myself to get better micros work on more of incorporating my wrist and fingertips because i do recognize that i'm more of an arm aiming preferred player so there's your distinction between an aim trainer main and uh like someone that we're trying to boost the strengths of and not really push them into uncomfortable positions because they need to compete. Um, but for us, we're just trying to maximize efficiency in everything, in every category and aim, or for me, I mean. It's, uh, it, it really is amazing how, how many options you have, because that, that's kind of, you know, what it, what I'm hearing from you and, and how much decision making that, that the, the individual can have in terms of how, where they want to kind of how they want to approach these problems because because i ended up you know working on my arm aiming and my tracking because of you know being a quake player and all these types of things was really good in in, in the horizontal and to some degree in in the vertical but there are some there are some situations where i still struggled but then when i when i started like learning how to incorporate my arm because i decided that i wanted to go down that route i i i as my tracking improved immensely because suddenly you know i realized that oh if even with a fast really fast sense I can always be in a position of strength with my wrist or, or fingertip aiming because the big downside I found with a high sense and wrist and fingertip aiming is you can kind of easily get, especially with like a light and a small mouse, you can easily get to like the end range and then and but need to be in neutral at that point so to, to aim. So you're having to like have these awkward spots with aiming where you, it's very, very difficult. And I found like, oh, if I just try to center things around more of an arm aiming first, I can use my arm to always keep my wrists and fingertips in the optimal, most effective kind of uh, neutral position. And I can, that means I can essentially react to something kind of behind me, like instantly and still have really good control and then instantly switch, switch back, still have really good control. And as I went through that journey, I, I, it was re it's really satisfying because I have been, you know, I've been playing FPS games for like 20 years and it's not until the last like, you know, couple of years or well, I should say last year that I started to see massive gains in that area just because of the decision to work on incorporating it, incorporating an extra technique it's wild that's why we encourage it with our uh with our clients to at least experiment with it if they haven't tried it before uh or to at least try to work it in because ideally ideally the best aimer is going to be able to make use of fingertips wrist and arm um we just try to not really be too pushy about it if they really don't want to or if they don't really feel comfortable at it at a first pass, I just think that it's worth a try. If you haven't like played at a high sense before, say you've always been a low sense player, say you've you don't really recognize that you have the best reactivity at like wide angles and stuff like that, uh, or narrow angles. I mean, 
you should probably give it a try. Play higher sends, experiment with your aim. And the same goes for the opposite. Like, if you've been a high sense player, try to make use of your arm a little bit more. It's it's funny too because the the amount of excuses I feel like that get destroyed by the kind of stuff that you guys have accomplished in the aiming community is really funny. Like I I have like you know fast sensitivity. I have you know small mouse, like very light mouse, and I'm like on a sky pad. So like and I play with like twenty five to thirty cm. Well, actually mostly twenty five cm. And I'm like ah oh, you know I I'm just never gonna get like really sick at static aiming because this is just like the worst setup for this ever. And then I see cartoon. Just like with like <laughs> the same setup, exactly, basically. Super fast send, skypad, all of the rest of it. And he's just, just smashing scores. And he's 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 doing it just arm only as well. And I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> like Cartoon is, is just the best. <laughs> <laughs> Insane. Same but... with Clover as well. Uh I'm sure you heard about Clover. Mm -hmm. I I consider him to be like I actually do consider him to be the best gamer in the world. And if not, then definitely by far the best tracking player in the world. He plays these high sensitivities, and he's just uh, not just in tracking. He's also really good static, in the same kind of way as uh, that cartoon is. And he doesn't play, he doesn't play the optimization route like I do for like seventy plus CM per three hundred and sixty sensitivity. He plays normal like forty eight middle of the range for static. But yeah, cartoon, cartoon is just different. <laughs> man i don't i don't understand how he can do 27 cm like i've been wanting to do it myself he, what, what he's doing is the old uh season three voltaic benchmarks in the kovacs uh in kovacs fps aim trainer a lot of people think that it is like literally the best benchmark set i might try to do a 25 cm celestial all-rounder run through it who knows it's 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 incredible it really is incredible because not only does it take away the excuses that you guys are proving that it can be done but I just also love how with aim training, you can't get that good if just because of natural ability. Like it's, you can't, like it is has, it is so much about the right approach, being smart and analytical and, and having, uh, you know, just dedication. And that's how all of these guys get so good. And, and so it's, it's beautiful to just understand that everything is so merit-based. It just means that it is possible for everyone. That's what it really means to me, at least. Exactly. Um, so with that said, uh, we talked about some of the flicking, uh, techniques to be aware of. And I know we talked about tracking, uh, earlier. Do you think there's anything we, we sort of left on the table that might be good to highlight in this regard? I think we mentioned earlier with the Skooky video, uh, mousepad space usage has been like kind of a big breakthrough with me in tracking, precise tracking, because a lot of those, uh, smooth tracking scenarios that I showcase in the video are pretty linear and they cross really wide angles. They're really predictive. So you got to find ways to, if you're trying to focus on tracking, you got to find ways to maximize the usage of your mousepad space. Like I said, Clover, best tracker in the world. Like I think he's the best at doing that alongside Scoochie, uh, Scooky. And I think that I think the pivot smoothness in reactivity, reactive tracking, is also really important. I've been working on that. Uh, basically, what that means is whenever the bot's changing direction, like you're focusing on how smooth that is. You're not making it like a drastic flick on back onto the target, like an, a, for your adjustment. And I think, I think mostly in tracking, it's all just trying to minimize your overall tension, like. Yeah, you want to be focusing on where the tension is located on your arm, but for people like Clover and all the best trackers, like the whole idea is just keeping minimal tension and just keeping it as smooth as possible as you can make it. So th this this reminds me actually with tracking and, and some of the I would say a common scenario in Valorant or, or attack FPS when you're like holding an angle, maybe you miss your first bullet and you're gonna like spray the next like two three bullets to kind of kind of catch them as they're swinging. Um, but you need to really like you need to have like no tension almost there to be consistent. And yep. what I've noticed is that it's very punishing if you have a high sensitivity because it's you know there's this correlation between like if you have higher sensitivity, the same amount of tension is going to result in more more uh, potential errors in that scenario. Whereas if you, if you have a lower sensitivity, and I think this is why people in tax shooters tend to advise oh it's a bit easier to play low sense 
because the tension isn't going to, I think, throw you off as much. So you'll probably be more consistent there. So if you're a higher sentence player, I think it's really important to think about just like that tension in the tracking. Um, and because this is also something I notice when people are surprised or let's say they're in a scenario where they're, they're, they're surprised and they don't necessarily have great technique on the fast strafes tracking when someone like gets in front of their face in a pistol round and they're running really fast because they're holding a pistol you know i see a lot of people tense up and and uh because they're surprised and because they don't know how to control that uh, for the technique that they need right then and so the tracking is just like horrendous like you miss everything <laughs> yeah i think the pistol rounds and uh, when you're being rushed like that it's also like it's also the the, the out the external stress of like being rushed in the game uh, that's also impacting them. And I think that it, that's one of the rare cases, actually. Not, uh, I'd like to bring back like the MBM method of dynamic clicking. It's one of the rare cases where like you can have controlled like spam shooting, is what I like to call it. So controlled spamming, instead of just straight up just jitter clicking and missing everything. Uh, you try to shoot on a, at an interval for things like that. So that as well requires tension management and it's controlled spamming so you need to have uh you need to be aware of the fact that you're getting like pushed and you need to be aware of your, the stress or the adrenaline as a result so that you can react like that instead of whiffing everything mm. it's it's interesting because I, th I think tracking is a is a really tricky one for people because it's just not a skill that tends to really get trained a lot in tax shooters. It's, it's so flicking dominant. And something I noticed as a, as a Quake player, especially an old school Quake player, is there used to be the lightning gun, which is like the main kind of tracking weapon, is this continuously like firing beam that you just like track people with. Um, it, it used to be the case a long time ago that the, the there would be a little bit of lag so you were forced to be predictive to actually hit them you couldn't just aim on top of them you had to, actually had to aim ahead of them because there was a lag on the on the it's like almost like it was a projectile lag um and so everyone had to essentially was was training in, with that in mind and that went away like later on because they just changed how it worked the net code improved significantly so you could just point and click but something i noticed that um when my tracking is off and i see this in aim trainers a lot is I'm always kind of like catching up to the target and I'm not kind of, you know, like in my brain, it feels like I'm having my crosshair be on the target, but I'm like behind it, if that makes sense, as opposed to almost being predicting where it's going, but also having it be kind of reactive in this at the same time. Do you understand sort of what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think, I think with targets that you're just, you're like constantly falling behind and it's mm. like, it's not really... Is it really like a reactive target? Is it strafing constantly, or is it, uh, or is it more linear and you're just not? So uh, sometimes it's it's or it tends to be like I'll notice it even with just you know the kind of linear just like it's it you know it's it's a it's just a really wide strafe and eventually it's going to change direction. But I, you know, right. but but you don't have to think about that very much. I think part of that is just uh, you could say it's smoothness, like just generally being shaky on the jittering and you're just call it's causing you to fall back on the strafe but for a lot of players especially in reactive it's just trusting the movement trusting that the, the bot say it's like it's just going straight and it's not going to just start doing that um it's not going to do anything crazy and it's just trusting that the bot movement is going to continue until it doesn't uh and part of that is all just it's all just movement reading uh being able to read the target, being able to react to it smoothly and not mess up your perception of the map, uh, that's probably what it is. Uh, just trusting each strafe and not lagging behind uh, or predicting in the other in the opposite direction because you think it's going to turn, you think it's going to turn until it, until it doesn't. Um, on that point, I think with the quake tracking thing, is that really uh, probably where this habit of predicting your tracking motion comes about? Because I don't know. I have not heard that LG used to be like uh, delayed like that. Yeah, like spaghetti, spaghetti LG. Yeah, it was. It was like that in. Um, so when did they switch to different mod? So I think that changed in like two thousand and five, two thousand four, two thousand five. But so pre pre that time. Um, <laughs> I would not know. Yeah. Um, it was it was like a 
because there was a for some reason there was a built-in like 50 ms delay in the game um so even on lan it was still although it was still like you know really responsive there was still a little delay so you, so you had to it, it was wavy essentially um if that makes sense that's how it used to be and so um that's and that's when i first got really good at tracking because i got that was when I, the time period when i i got to really good uh, to like a pro level initially um and then later on it was it became just point and click but i noticed that you know with tracking just if you can understand how the target's going to move and when you're playing obviously any game you understand the situ the context of the situation what is the geometry what type of swing should they be doing are they going to try to like a faker movement because you understand like the dodging meta and all these different things and then so you kind of are forced in quake to to predict from that sense too in understanding how they're going to move so so it's the extra element of how will they dodge what i'm shooting at them because people try mm. all sorts of tactics to try to do that so you're in quake are always forced to, to to think about that whereas in tactical fps games people might kind of like jiggle peak or they might you know start a step but generally speaking they don't have as much movement to work with to actively dodge when you're in a gunfight so i feel like what you're saying about just trusting the movement is important and the first thing you mentioned was actually where i noticed i struggled and when I, when I, so which was, you mentioned that you just, there might be too much jitter. So not enough smoothness with the tracking. And so I would find if I would do a bunch of, um, you know, tracking tasks, various tracking tasks in, in, you know, in, in the aim labs or, or in, you know, coax or whatever, that would kind of like help me to kind of mentally correct that. And then when I would go into the game, I actually would, I would massively benefit from that. It would feel really good, but it was that I I wouldn't be able to stay on target and I'd like have to like keep catching up again like constantly as opposed to just being able to just do it if that makes mm. sense I'm having to constantly try to like oh how much have I fallen behind okay how much do I have to like compensate to catch back up these types of things and then also the other thing is the arm tension too that was another area where I have to had to keep kind of focusing on making sure I wasn't making mistakes there and I just can't practice that if I'm playing Valorant I just got, I mean it's just not enough. There's not enough like reps to be able right. to do that. I think with smoothness, it's there are ways, obviously, to like force smoothness out of ourselves, like drop the sensitivity or really or double the sensitivity and like go on a low FOV and just see where the jitters are. That's one way we could do it. Uh, but I do think that it's it's mostly just seeing a strafe and uh, without necessarily looking at the cross there, just trusting that it's going to continue. Uh, I like the points about the LG because in Overwatch, there's a lot of tracking. There's a way, there's way more tracking opportunities than you get at Valorant. So, like, I, I kind of see the kind of issue we're talking about because I would try to do, like, I would do ADAD spam on someone and they're playing Soldier, but then I would just, I would just transfer myself into this really long, long, long strafe around them, and they would just con they would whiff everything in that <laughs> entire process because they can't trust because they saw me ADAD. I kind of conditioned them in that little fight to think that I'm just going to continue doing that. So then I'm just going to hold A uh, all the way through, and they're just going to keep on lagging behind, lagging behind, lagging behind until I switch direction eventually. So that's kind of what I was thinking about when you brought these things up. So it's it could be it's it's both smoothness, and that has to do with tension, but also just reading and just knowing that it's knowing that it's going to continue its direction until it doesn't, and you just have to just continue that strafe through. Yeah, that that's a great example actually. What you reminded me of is almost like a because I was trying to put myself in that position because I've been in that position in Quake so many times where. Um, I'm almost, there's almost like, like, well, like we talk about arm tension, there's almost like too much mental tension where I'm trying to predict too hard as to like what the guy is doing as opposed to, and then, and then if I'm doing that, I will allow myself to be pretty conditioned. But if I'm just kind of like confidently reacting, um, then I notice that I tend to perform better. So there's, uh, it's interesting how there can be too much mental tension to an extent too. Um, I think another part of it could just be mouse pad space. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and like, uh, how comfortable your comfortable range on the mouse pad is like say your range on the mouse pad isn't that far because it's like say you know your low sense or i mean well what sense would you usually run for a scenario like that um i i run 25 cm on like almost everything these days well forever actually kind of be myself so i think with 25 cm like 
the amount of space that you use on the mouse pad isn't going to be like a lot, but you're not really maybe used to going out towards the edges of the pad and making use of that space. So when you eventually have to bend your wrist like that or move your arm to incorporate your arm, the your tension may be fine, but it just might feel like it's an uncomfortable angle that you're yeah. continuing the tracking motion on. That's just what I'm assuming, uh, generally. Yeah, that's that's very true. Yeah, that 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 was that was definitely something that the aim aim training helped me to understand. As I started to try to like fix things, I started to notice all these points where I just wasn't comfortable. And again, having played. At, at you know really like good level for like many years it was surprising to me to see how many leaks there were that i could work on um by going through that process of where i'm uncomfortable and why is that the case um should we uh, try out oh, go ahead. um we should try out like uh scenarios that um wind around the player and do like these 360 motions that aren't really they're not hard targets they don't have mo hard movement patterns but you should see how it feels just having targets that cause you to move your mouse and like kind of entangle your 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 arm and your and how you bend your wrist in these really weird angles just to see how it feels yeah that uh, the reason i like like you uh highlighting that is because something i've noticed people saying that pick up aim training actually and like do the benchmarks like i've actually seen um i think uh, katsumi who's a, a gc player in valorant has, has talked uh, on twitter about sort of like her just going through all the benchmarks and 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 she, you know she describes how yeah i just feel way more confident like my my floor everyone everyone uh, other than her i've also spoken to that have gone through the same thing said oh my floor has improved a lot and and because the interesting thing about when you improve your floor is that that is a, an immensely effective way to improve your confidence and that has a great, you know, mental implication when you're actually trying to perform in, in hard spots because you feel like you're capable of, of handling anything because you've, you've, by working on these techniques and ironing out all of these like bits where you would normally be uncomfortable, you're not running into those as much anymore. And, and, to, and that, that in of itself, that process of fixing those things, I think allows you to feel a lot more confident in your aiming as well as, yeah, just having, being more consistent. Mm -hmm. And if you're more consistent, you're probably more likely to hit your ceiling more frequently. And the distance between your, your floor and your ceiling is generally less. So, I mean, Liege, Liege was the person that introduced to me the ABC game concept, which is uh, uh, essentially, I mean, it, it's, it's a, it's pretty complicated thing um, if you want to go dig into it, but the most basic aspect of it is that your performance is a range and you want to tighten that up as much as possible so that your floor is really close to your ceiling. And so that's what consistency is. So on your, on, on your, on a day when, you know, you can win a tournament in, in your, in your B game, for example, mm -hmm. um, is, is the idea um, ultimately with that. So I love this, this idea of trying to pick these things that make you a bit uncomfortable. Um, right. Um, I, I really want to talk about uh, the Voltaic daily improvement method because we talked about some of the ways that, you know, people might run into like struggling in, without a coach. And uh, so, you know, shout outs to Low Gravity 56 who, who created this with uh, some co-collaborators. Well. Were, were you one of the collaborators? That I think I was, yeah. Okay, well, uh, <laughs> shout outs to you as well for putting, putting this together. And essentially what the Voltaic daily improvement method is, is you go through different uh, skill categories each day of the week. And so you're, you're just focusing quite, and it gives you, um, there's a document that you can read. And so you can go, okay, today is Monday. We're doing this skill. We're doing this playlist. And we're trying to achieve like these things within this, the skill category. So it's trying to focus you on improving, you know, one category kind of per day, as opposed to just playing a bunch of different things. And a lot of people have, have, uh, who've run through it have, have reported back very, um, you know, well, essentially they've experienced a lot of success in improving their scores much more quickly. Um, so what do you, having also, you know, put this together, how do you feel like VDIM is, is, would you like recommend it really highly to people? I think, well, I'll, let me just say LG is like, he's an amazing scenario creator and like he's worked on all of this. So shout outs to him indeed. But the Voltaic daily improvement method, it's actually based off of, or it's, it's originally based off of my Kovacs routines that were the threshold aim training method that we discussed last time we talked. So you'll notice that it will go through a list of the kind of strengths or the kind of skill sets that you'll need to do well on the Voltaic benchmarks. So I think that the main thing is uh, improving at the Voltaic benchmarks and ranking up in them. That was the main actual goal of the Voltaic daily improvement method. 
And for anyone who wants to push themselves in the voltaic benchmarks, that's how that's the those are the routines that I would expect them to use, um, because they they take you through the routine in increasing difficulty all the way up until the benchmark scenario itself, where you play it and then you're expected to hit a high score and move up a rank. Those uh, those players are mainly the main audience that I just think the voltaic daily improvement method applies. Yeah, I, 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 I've tried it and I, I really enjoyed it. I definitely recommend it as well. It's If you have no idea what you're doing, it's definitely a great thing that you could jump into. Um, mm -hmm. So big recommend on that. I'll also link the uh, the document for that too. I don't know if, uh, if it's updated at the moment, but either way, even if it's not, the playlist will still be there and it will still be effective because, because it's evergreen, I would say, uh, the skill sets you're trying to improve. Um, are there any other? I do uh, think. Okay. Oh, uh, another note on the Voltaire Daily Improvement Method. I just, it, as as good as it is for the benchmark set, I think I would want to answer the question that some players would have, like, oh, is this really good for like an all round thing, or uh, can I transfer it in game? I would say that it's really good for just core aim improvement, but I think you really want to supplement it with game specific routines and things that you'll find elsewhere in the community if you're trying to improve it like overwatch you want to also try to find like or to create maybe your own routine based off of the voltaic daily improvement method for overwatch because i i think that the core is good but you also need that the the scenarios that will translate the most that makes a lot of sense and and i know also um again i, I feel like I, I don't know what the percentage is but i imagine a large percentage of people um, who are interested in hearing these topics from us are probably on the tactical FPS side, just because it's the larger uh, pool of, of players in terms of the esport. Um, and so, uh, of course, uh, there is the um, the Valorant specific benchmark as well, which I would expect translates for quite well for Counter Strike players. Also, um, that will take also have. So it's also something if you if you're like completely clueless um, and and don't know where to look, also for what could be some good tasks for how you could break down some of the various like flicking specific skills or micro correction specific skills that um that you know Matty's essentially saying you know here are some more game specific stuff for a valorant player or a cs player um you could you could definitely go there to get some more resources okay anything anything else to anything else to add with the vdim uh not really just okay. go check them out all right sweet okay so um, we, I did this with mini and I would love to, um, you know, I think this is a great thing to even rehash some of these things as well for people, because there are, st is, you know, how, how it is like some of these, uh, the aiming myths are, are quite persistent and tricky to kind of knock on the head. And, and so I think the biggest one is, you know, a perfect sensitivity exists and that if you have a sensitivity, you know, you should stick to it no matter what. And if you change that, you know, it's, it's going to be a problem. So, um, 